One, Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. In order to keep Fishing the DMV alive through 2024, we need 100 Patreon subscribers. We only need one more Patreon subscriber to achieve our goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a jackhammer chatterbait or a pack of Senkos, you can help keep Fishing the DMV alive. All Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits. You'll get access to our private Facebook group community, members only content, weekly Patreon supporter giveaways, and so much more. We only need one more, one more person to sign up and we'll have cracked our major milestone. Thank you guys so much for everything that you do. I really appreciate it. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. We are in the first Monday Night Live of March, and this time next week, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have one more hour of daylight. Thank Christ. Daylight savings time is next weekend. It's here. Spring is in the air. Uh, I keep saying this shit, and we're going to get murdered with a snowstorm probably next week. But at least right now, it feels like everything is moving towards that like that early pre-spawn vibe, at least here in Northern Virginia. Uh, I have a friend of mine. I think he's in the chat right now. I think he actually caught a dirty 30 out of Virginia at a lake. Uh, he has a video coming out on that soon, but he'll let us all know when he's ready for that. But that's, that's pretty cool here. And a guy that's probably caught two or three dirty thirties in his life, at least maybe he has, maybe he has, but I'm going to hype him up. Like he has, I have him on the show tonight with Tyler high pole of Lake Anna. It's, it's been way too long since we talked about Lake Anna and we're going to get into Lake Anna too, but I also want to pick his brain on just how he gets ready for the season. You, you know, with so many guys, I think that's interesting when you fish a lot, it's a sport, you're an athlete and you're out of shape. It's the preseason. You're getting back into getting a bunch of days on the water what he does to stay in shape. I think he does like the carnivore diet. I don't know if that helps him with his jerk bait bite. Maybe it does, but we'll be talking about that as well. Uh, and then again, always ask a good question. You're going to win a prize. The thing that people are going to ask about the chat. Uh, yes, we did hit our Patreon goals. I have been off social media since Friday, believe it or not. I just came back into social media today. So I've been out of it a little bit, but yes, we did hit our Patreon goals. I want to thank everyone so much for that. I'm going to have a big spiel about that later on in the week, but I just want to say thank you so much. But anyway, we got all that stuff out of the way. Without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, uh, the legend of Lake Anna. Tyler, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me, Thomas. It's great to be here. Absolutely love the fishing and DMV community. Like, I don't know how many people know me just from being on the podcast and the community is great. So, you know, I love talking fishing, getting on here and doing this is awesome. I ran into a guy um, at the the Dale City show, and he talked about how his boat broke down. And I think I didn't get to talk to you about this, by the way, uh, yet. But his boat broke down on Lake Anna, mm -hmm. and apparently somebody drove past him, and he heard his voice, and he's like, "Is your name Tyler? I heard from you from fishing the DMV, and you ended up towing him uh, in the other. Like I think this was a couple couple months ago, but he told me that yeah. whole ordeal that he just heard your voice, and he's like, "Wait, I think I know you." <laughs> yeah yeah no that was tommy shout out to five four of fishing <laughs> met him that way we were fellow drifters that day he needed he needed a little bit of gas i was like on the phone and in the middle of the lake and i see him and like people are driving by and on stop and i see him and i'm like i mean you always got you got to help someone out in the water for sure that's first and foremost i don't care if i'm in the middle of catching one if someone needs something like i'm gonna do what i can do to help them so ran got him gas got a new contact and, you know, just been talking fishing ever since. So, you know, little things like that happen, but yeah, no, that was, that, that was interesting. That was funny. That was, a, that was an interesting day. That's freaking awesome, dude. I mean, what it's been so long since you've been on the show. Like what, what have you been up to since November ish? Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, a lot, a lot, like I heard you mention just about like staying in shape and stuff. So yeah, like that's, that's huge to me. Um, I, I do that. I'm, I'm in, I'm a gym rat a little bit. Basically my life is gym, fish, sleep, and then work. And then, you know, work is, you know, I, I it's important, but like, I don't know, fishing is work. Like I can call it like guiding work, but my other work, I, I have a lot of free time. Um, so I do, contract work right now um and, and it's awesome i can just whatever i need to get done i get it done and then i just stay fishy i'm on the water 
all the freaking time. Like if I don't have to be in a meeting or talk to a company about some things that they want, they want done. And, and if I'm, you know, free, I'm on the water or I'm going out on breakdown trips. We've already had a few this year or doing guide trips. Um, That's awesome. And then just like getting the boat ready and getting everything um, situated and, and all that in orders. Like I just had a massive order come in with all sorts of cool stuff that people are going to get to use this year. Oh, cool. um, and then on top of that, just staying on top of the fish. It is so important in the winter as a guide, especially to stay on top of the fish. It makes my job so much easier if I can go out and locate them in the winter. Um, you know, it's not always the best weather. It's not always the prettiest get to catch a few, but for the most part, I am like scouting. Like I am finding groups and groups and groups and tracking those groups. And I've done this and I fished the lake since I was like 11 or 12, uh, really, really little. And honestly, sometimes I go back to information from there and, and then add it to my current game plan. So, but yeah, staying on top of the fish is super important in the winter, I think as a guide, um, winter trips, like I had a few, but I mean, that's mainly like striper territory. I get asked to go on those trips, but like, I, I'm like upfront with people. I'm like, look, like you want to go catch largemouth and like, you want the best experience for largemouth catching and just learning the lake go with me. But like when people want to go on striper hybrid trips, I'm like, I recommend the other guides because I can put you on striper. Like I can put you, I don't, I know exactly where they are. I know that, but like, it's like one of those things where I'm like, I don't want to like, you know, get dabble into that and at too far and get out of my comfort zone. Um, you know, some people are like, dude, I just want to catch anything. And that's awesome. So, you know, striper tend to be in a lot of these places where bass are. Yeah. And that's something we'll get into eventually. Um, when you talk about getting, let's say you do take a month or two off from fishing. And I know there's probably one or two people in the chat right now. We have 50 people on YouTube and Facebook. We have about 10 people on Instagram watching right now. There's a few people that probably are just getting back into fishing. Uh, and you talk about the gym rat, the dieting, the exercise. I am going to be doing a live stream about strength and conditioning and stuff since that's kind of my old career path. But I'd like to get your thoughts on how do you mentally prep and physically prep to get back into being on the water so much? Yeah. So honestly, I think I, I probably have talked to this on this podcast before. So I, I was having like a, a ton of stomach issues um, that was going on with me. And I was noticing like I was just like fatigued, like on the water. I mean, granted, I was on the water from like 5 a.m. to like 8 p.m. during like 9 p.m. for a lot of last summer. Um, and I was like, you know, like something's not right. I had gotten tests done and I was like, yeah, I needed to get back into the gym. I have always have been kind of an active person. Um, and that was huge for me this year was like, so like on average, I probably I average around 18 running 18 miles uh, a week. Um, Holy crap, dude. And then I do weights five to seven days a week, just depending on like how my body feels and how I need to recover. Um, and I'll be honest, what, I'm in the I'm in the best shape of my life. Like even when I was younger, when I'm on the water, like dude, I'm just juiced up. Like I'm just ready to freaking go. It's awesome. Like today I got today was fantastic. Like I got to I got to feel my hook set. It's feeling good. It's feeling a little bit better. Um, but yeah, diet is super important um, as far as just staying, uh, you know, healthy out there. I do a little, I, I have, I'm introducing a little bit more complex carbs into it, but yeah, I do eat a lot of meat. Um, most of my carbs for the most part are like brown rice and blueberries. And like, I eat like, and like, if I'm eating like fats, it's like almonds. Like, you know, I was actually on a uh, breakdown trip the other day and I was choke. I was, I literally was choking on an almond as we were driving down the lake and I was like, yeah. So, uh, yeah, what is so. your what is your caloric? And so I've always been. I will. I will see Shane Flight saying like we have a fellow runner. I will run, but it's always fifteen to twenty minutes tops because I'm more of a power lifter than I am like a long distance runner. When you're dropping twenty miles, mm. how the how much are you eating? Honestly, some days not enough. Eating is the hardest part. So I can cut. Like I'm great at cutting, but like like bulking up like that sort. So I lost about. Uh, from this time last year, I've lost 30 pounds of fat. Um, Jesus. and I've gained 10 pounds of, of a little less than 10 pounds of muscle. My body fat percentage was sub 10 recently. And so I was, I mean, like I was, I was lean, like I was shredded. I wasn't like this bulky, but I, I mean, I like shredded lean and calories are the hardest part. Like I, I need to eat when I'm running that much, I need to eat like 
almost 3000 just to gain. Um, I've started to kind of go down the cardio as I want to like bulk and I'm just high protein, like whey protein, creatine and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, I try to eat around 2,500 and I'm still, it's, that's still almost a deficit with how much I'm running. So I'm actually in like the process of calculating and getting that a little bit down. I'm probably going to run a little bit less and do weights a little bit harder just for now. Cause like I got, I got too lean to be honest. Travis Cyber, I like this is not even a question, but you're winning a gift card for this. I want this to be a shirt. IPAs and squats, no better combo. Yeah. That has got to be a lifting shirt. Uh, Kyle, I that's because you were a you weren't a pitcher, Thomas. You're right. I got to just work on power hitting, so it's just eat and lift heavy things and hit ball far. Um, <laughs> with that said, when you're getting back into fishing, what is the biggest rust? for you to brush off is it technique specific is it getting your eyes dialed into forward facing sonar again to make sure that's something i've seen on my tiny ass screen where if i've taken a long time off it's like i need to get readjusted to what the hell i'm looking at and then i kind of feel like i'm in the flow again yeah no i would agree with that definitely just getting readjusted to to the screen when i am offshore and like uh you know like seeing like being able to say that's a bass versus like striper and hybrid those are easy to tell what that is or like that's a bass, that's a crappy, that sort of thing. How much do I need to lead my bait to this fish? Just getting those things dialed in, making sure like my screen isn't too stretched um, and stuff like that. I think that is just, if I do take a little bit of time off, getting in that rhythm um, and then just getting a good feel for the lake. Um, when you're on it so much, like things just start to go. Like you can just be like, I'm going there. And there's no like, you don't really know why it's just it kind of like tells you that whereas definitely in the winter and early in the year you're like things feel like dude oh my god like what is going on i'm kind of spun out right now so once you get on the lake and spend more time on the water and this translates like for me on anna but now if i were to go to like smith mountain if i were to go to chesden if i were to do something like that i think things would just start clicking so it's just like getting a feel for the lake. Like it's almost, it's almost hard to put into words, but once you're just out there so much, like your decision process is just so much smoother. I a hundred percent agree with that. It's getting those reps. It's getting back into the grind of it. And, and, and right now segueing more to like lake fishing and of course, like Anna too, what would you consider true pre-spawn? Is it a water temperature thing? Is it a gut thing? Is it when the dogwoods start blooming? What would you consider like a true pre-spawn time period? Yeah, no, that's like an interesting thing. And I even wrote an article about this and I wanted to be careful. So I wrote about like late winter and early pre-spawn. Um, Cause I mean, technically if you think about it, pre-spawn are like, I mean, that could even be like after fall fishing. Like that is like pre-spawn and winter fishing are kind of the same thing. I think that there's different stages of the pre-spawn winter kind of being one of them. Hmm. Um, Cause they're in those holes in the winter, but they're still making that same progression up to go spawn. So that's, you know, they're pre-spawn in that mode. They're just in their wintering holes. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to look about it. I think it's super subjective. Um, I, I know exactly what you're saying though. Like true pre-spawn is like, you've got them sliding off those winter holes. You've got big ones moving up to those first sets of points to the first sets of brush. And then you've got like that later where like they're actually, the big ones are like staging um, on, you know, different structures leading into spawning grounds. And that's kind of like what's going on right now. Lake Anna is so unique. So there's a really true winter bite going on. And then there's a very, very pre-spawn bite. And I caught one on a bed today, a male. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was early, it's the earliest fish i've ever ever caught and it's in the cove that everyone probably thinks it is and and that's exactly where it was it, ambitious bass how much i ask everyone this question because i think this is a fashioning rorschach test how much is daylight and like we always talk about temperature but to me daylight is fascinating because mm -hmm. in the fall we don't see the effects of daylight i think necessarily as drastic because daylight savings time is not till november I think if daylight savings time was the first week of September, early October, I think as anglers, we would really think daylight was an adjustment because we see the impact of that because of daylight savings time. But in the spring, next week, we have daylight savings time, which naturally I'm thinking like, well, spring's here because clearly we get more light, even though it's fake. It's just we adjusted the clock. 
-hmm. Do you think there's something to it? Like we just get a little extra daylight at some point in March or April. And that's like a sign to those fish. Like we got to push up a little bit sooner. Absolutely. 100%. Um, that's more important than anything I think is time of day. I think photo period, um, that's me again. I'm not trying to say this is 100% a fact based yeah. thing. This is just from what I've seen is photo period is absolutely the most important thing. And the, the days have been getting like substantially longer in my eyes. Like I've noticed where like, it was at one point it was like dark at five when I was at now it's like, I can fish till like six now, like before I really have to come when it starts. So from when I started going out in the winter, like back in December and all that and going like the daylight has been a full hour. So there's been a full hour change. Um, and I think that is huge water temperature. I think it's a combination. I don't, think there's one like you can't just say it's one thing moon phase is big um it, i mean we're at like a half moon right now and a buck made a bed so i mean i don't know but if you get a new moon or a full moon like it's it probably would have pushed up more it probably like i i've seen i've seen two on bed already bucks the ambitious ones My, maybe it's their first time spawning you know they're just super excited or something but it, it's uh photo period is going to be my number one thing water temperature uh and then moon phase um and if you get a, a combination of say you get a warm front with a full moon or a warm front with a new moon like absolutely you're gonna see a big pull up into spawning flats and spawning grounds does the size of the buck matter at all if you start seeing 12 inches and then all of a sudden a week later you start seeing you know a pound and a half a little bit bigger bucks does is does that matter at all or just it's just something random that popped in my head um you know it's i'm not so my biggest fish i've ever caught out of smith mountain was just under nine pounds on a bed and it was with the smallest buck i've ever seen so really <laughs> yeah so and it was it was a crazy it was a crazy catch it was like four of us i don't know how this fish bit like we pit, there was like four of us like we weren't it wasn't even like in a tournament thing like we were loud. We were freaking noisy. And I mean, it was just like one of those things. So, and that was with a very, very small buck. Um, and there was multiple bucks. So there was multiple bucks under the stock. I caught one to get the female to come up and the female took over the bed. And I knew I had like very short amount of time to get it to bite. Um, and yeah, that was with like a one pound buck. So, I mean, but I've also seen like, a big like a nice two pound buck with like a five pound largey in like the same vicinity on anna so i don't know how much it matters to be honest and this fish in smith mountain was really shallow too because they they spawn pretty deep there especially on the section that i was fishing just reading travis sorry guys i was just, i should actually be bringing these questions up my apologies um so we got travis cyber here uh the first big uh, I guess it's a question. Yeah, it's a question uh, for a man that pretty much predominantly fishes the forks and up. What advice would you give to fish from the plant down? That's a great question. Um, get really comfortable reading your mapping. Um, 90 over 90% of the fish on that section do not live on the bank. When you talk about the power plant and off, they go to the bank during certain times of the year and you can fish certain obvious structures, but get, like really comfortable with with mapping if you have forward facing or you don't have forward facing doesn't matter get really comfortable with your mapping and looking at high spots looking where creek channels go in and out looking at pinch points looking at flats um a bass's life like in those and that section revolves around flats and channels um and then there's little things on those that they like to sit on stumps brush piles docks rocks legit i mean there's there's everything but flats and channels and getting really comfortable with mapping and looking for your high spots and and where the channels and flats meet and different stuff like that and then uh, kyle i see your question we'll get to it here i i got a weird hybrid lake fork lake anna question we're getting to that time of year where people are going to start really gearing up their tournaments to lake anna uh if you guys have been living under a rock with all the drama online you know with toledo bend and lake fork they cracked them really good. And, and, and there were people that did use forward facing sonar. And this is not a, a forward facing sonar, uh, like drama debate. It's more of, let me try to like lay this out. If you're fishing a one day event, the F word, <sighs> we're getting into it, the F word. Yeah. We're, we're going to get into the F word here. Cause I think it's fascinating in a one day versus an elite four, three or four day event. 
how much would you want spawning fish to play into it versus just dealing with forward facing sonar and offshore fish? We're going to eventually get to a point where there will be a big push of good fish up on beds. Do you completely ignore them and just be like, hey, I'm just going to do forward facing sonar or offshore? Or is there going to be a time period this spring where it's like, I'm going to hunt for enough beds that I can, I, I have that available? Yeah. So for my question, like the answer to this question for me would be different if I was going to a different lake. My strength is offshore is absolutely offshore fishing now. So if I was going to a lake where I didn't have the luxury and know where a lot of the spawning flats are, I'm I'm going offshore. I don't I don't care if it's April 15th, full moon, warm front, and somehow we got a, another hour of daylight. Like it doesn't matter to me. I'm gonna fish my strength if I was in a tournament situation. On Anna, I have the luxury and what I did today after I after I had a trip really early this morning and I went out is I caught fish in 37 foot of water and fish in three foot of water Jesus so damn, damn on dude. anna i can do that but if i'm going somewhere else i'm going to live and die about what i'm good at i'm not gonna i, I can sight fish i like sight fishing it's you know i love, absolutely love sight fishing i think it's very fun it's like the most personal way of fishing that you can ever have it's just mono e mono it's it almost feels like a little standoff it's it's so fun but in a tournament situation i'm going to just stick to my strengths I just always been interested about that with um as a guy that's really good at offshore fishing and forward facing sonar and yourself like do you think the the bed fishing thing do you think that still has a place to play in a person's arsenal in 2024 or is that something you think it's going to be phased out to more like no you just need to stay offshore and hunt it's a good question um i think there's potential for sure if you get i uh, it's so hard in a tournament situation, yeah. especially with a big field on Anna. Someone's probably done it and they can like fact check me on it, but it's a hard place to find five good ones and have them all to yourself without somebody else knowing where they are. Like you, that really has to be your thing. Like you've got to be a, a mini Drew Cook, a mini Drew Benton. Like that's got to be like your thing is like, you know, that you can find them, you can find the nooks and crannies where other people aren't looking, where other people can't get a bait. Because there's so many fish that spawn that True. nobody's finding. There's so many. Um, I mean, obviously, if everyone found every single one, like, you know, our lakes would suck. So there's successful spawn going on all the time. And if you're one of those guys that, like, really knows what you're looking for, then I think it's possible. But it's really hard to say. Um with just how things are going and the biggest population of fish is usually behind you when you're fishing the bank. So I, I yeah, cause I, I agree with what you said about the, the biggest population is always behind. I, I feel like a spot spawning is your primary game plan. I feel like we'll always have a little bit more weight in a one day event. Yeah. I, I think the three day, the four day events of having a, a spawning bite hold out, I think that's gone. I think with, with, with FS, the way FFS, the way it is nowadays, you just can't crack. You could probably crack a 30 pound bag one time on the beds, but you're not going to do it four days in a row with the hammers and how they're doing it. Yeah. Uh, and we got Blink Nation. Blink Nation here has got one. Wasn't there a guy who took down a recent open fishing shallow without? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. No, so that's like with forward facing. <laughs> yeah, it's with forward facing. And, but this is always the thing. Like, I know someone in the comment section is like, wasn't there this dude one time? I know one time you'll get a John Cox. I'm saying on average, is that how you want to actually plan your day? That's what I mean. Yeah. Of course, there's going to be exceptions to the rule there. Um, that's just what's going to happen. Then we got Colt. Or I'm sorry. Uh, his name is Colt. A bunch of ones, but his real name is in the next message, which is Randy, one of my Patreon subscribers. Uh, Tyler, what is your favorite part of Smith Mountain Lake and why? Thanks. Uh, like the dam, the lower end, deep clear, where the small mouth and predominantly like small mouth and large mouth mix in. Um, like the mouth of the black water, mouth of the Roanoke to the dam. Um, that's my favorite. Uh, again, it just offers so much more like offshore type fishing um and i just think from my experience that's where your biggest population of big fish live this is a fun question all right we're gonna get into the drama here um and i'm gonna add to this guy's question uh or, or statement uh timmy uh says <laughs> waiting for tyler to spill the juice on anna 
is Anna a place where it is? It, would you say it's a spot place or a pattern like first off? And then would you really think there's juice to win there? Or is it just about understanding how to run a pattern if it is a pattern like? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I always look at spots and patterns as interchangeable. Oh, um, so if you can find a spot, you can make that a pattern if you know the lake well enough and then go hit similar stuff. You don't have to know it that well. If you get bit doing something on offshore, like you have to pay attention to all these variables around you. Look at your mapping is more important. This isn't a forward facing thing. I know like everyone, like you're, it's a mapping thing. It's an absolute mm -hmm. mapping thing, especially on lowland reservoirs like Anna, when you get to that, when you get to that dam side, it's a, it's a 100% a mapping thing. So you can turn a spot into a pattern. Um, a lot of times you can run up, say I'm fishing a flat that is on the inside channel bend on the main river that, and it, there's a flat. So I'm catching fish there. It's a spot. There's brush around that spot. All I need to do is just look at my map and find the next area with a similar setup, same side of the lake um, and go and more often than not, you're going to find fish. So like, yeah, it's like spot specific because they're, but like the thing on Anna, it's loaded with brush. Like any, ob any somewhat obvious spot, like someone's put brush there or there's, there's something there already. And then you go to the next one that looks like that and there's brush there. Um, so, and a lot, you know, not all of it is brush related. Like there's a lot of like high spots and stuff on the main lake out in the middle that are very close to the main river channel. Um, and you can do that. I can tell you today, I did run a pattern like I, I mean i i caught fish doing a little bit of everything today but the big fish that i caught today were all on secondary points on stumps on isolated stumps when i was a long time ago when i was fishing a college tournament um it was i think this was lake murray in practice and we asked one of the locals there and he saw that we we're from out of town we're just some retarded college kids and i asked him like what what and this was the, i said what the juice is and he looked at me he's like it's not about the juice it's about how much time you spent behind your graph and he left yeah. that was it and i didn't think about it much until i got older it's like what the hell do you mean by that and when you're talking about the brush piles and the stumps it's like it's not the juice necessarily is it it's about how many days did you do not bring fishing gear and you just marked every damn brush pile and every stump so you yeah. know where it is yeah like i mean i'm on i don't even know how many little things i, I probably have over a thousand some waypoints on anna of just like little things um and T timmy timmy knows how to catch them out there too so he's just being really <laughs> goofy he knows how to catch them out there me and him will find the same fish often we had a little conversation like we were both fishing different tournaments and he was like we were like oh yeah that's but yeah that's where i caught that's where i caught 17 and i'm like was well, that's the creek and i was like yeah that's where i'm gonna be in the morning so we find the same groups of fish it seems like and the same stuff and i think we have a little bit of a similar fishing style and yeah it's just i love the sports psychology and i think in the psychology and fishing where we say it's a secret spot but a, a, a secret in and of itself and if everyone listening pay attention to this a secret means you can't find it most of the things we yeah. consider a secret anyone can find if you're willing to put the time in to go look yeah, there's no secrets on Anna. I can't even tell you how many, like, how many times, like, I've actually, I've never even thought this. I've got, like, maybe four or five things that I don't think a lot of people know about, but I don't know how many brush piles or little sneaky spots and all that stuff that people know about. And I know they do, or I know that someone was there like 20 minutes before me and I just didn't see them. Uh, so that's like, I don't let that get to me though. I don't know. It's mental. Like you got to be like, I don't care if someone was here. I'm going to do something different to figure out how to make these fish bite. How, how do you deal with that? Cause that is such a, I, I really think as anglers, this is what holds really, this is what holds good anglers back from being great anglers. Is this again, guys, this is just, let me know in the comment section. If you think I'm like full of crap here. People, I think, hold themselves back by saying it's because of a secret spot or a secret bait. And the people that really come to mind, like a Watson, who he really popped when the Whopper Plopper was a secret bait. But then once everyone knew about that, he dropped off the face of the earth because he seemed to really rely on a secret bait or a secret spot. And after I've interviewed everybody, 
there's not a lot of secrets. Everyone, what they think is a secret, somebody else is also throwing it. It's because your confidence is wrapped up that nobody else knows about it. And I feel like that hurts you as a fisherman because if that stops working, you don't have the confidence to just go out and adapt. Yeah. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. There's no secrets. I'm like the most open fisherman that I know. <laughs> so I tell people all the stuff, all the stuff that I find out, like I've definitely thrown some stuff or been like one of the first couple people to throw some stuff on Anna. Um, and then I, I'm just like, I'll just show it, tell somebody I don't care. <laughs> so, And the other thing is like, if anyone thinks they have a secret spot on Anna, they don't. <laughs> so you got to get that out of your head. I promise you, me or somebody else knows exactly where it is, especially if it's a brush pile because who, someone made that brush pile that you found. So <laughs> somebody knows about it. There's very, very few secrets. I think what you can get secret is, is your technique and how you approach that yeah. um, and how you approach a certain situation can be a little bit different, whether you're going to sit off the fish a little bit more. You're going to adjust your boat position. You're going to read them. You're interpreting the data on the screen constantly. That's what I'm doing. Like I'm just being a little computer trying to process this data, constantly seeing what the fish are doing. Are you feeding up? Are you feeding down? When I threw at this brush pile and I made commotion, did the striper roll through and then the bass dropped to the bottom? So now I'm going to throw a Carolina rig or a Nico rig and catch them off the bottom. Are they suspended? Like, what, how far do I need to stay off the brush pile to see how the fish interact? Because the fish 100% can pick up that something's not right after a few casts. I tried to make my first cast almost about 80 feet away. Um, sometimes even more if I can really bomb what I'm doing. Like when I'm doing my big top water deal, like that's not a secret. <laughs> so if I'm doing that, I'm, I'm bombing 120 feet away at what I want to fish. Um, so there's different things like that and you just got to read the data. That's what's going to separate you. But as far as thinking you have a secret spot or a secret bait, you don't. So I just completely ignore that and I just go fishing and each day read what's going on. Yeah. Cause I, I think it's, I, I, I do believe that you can get a hot technique and you got to stay up on the new hot techniques, but you got to understand that that's fading. Like, uh, the strolling is hot right now spoilers if you guys aren't aware of that and eventually everyone will do it and then you're gonna have to move on to the next thing but you still need to know how to demiki rig uh wacky worm shit like that because it's not always just going to be the hot thing and i think travis has got travis is coming in off the the high bar here uh slamming with the it seems like in today's in today's age the secrets <laughs> are in the settings of your graph oh my goodness look at this person <laughs> right here hot um, uh we said that word so we yeah, asked, I that, asked for it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that's interesting. I know there's so much drama around that, but it's also the people that hate forward facing sonar don't seem to use a lot of spinning tackle either, which I think is quite interesting as well. It, it's it's not adapting to the fact that everything's getting super finessey. And you guys go back on this show, like I've said it, like bait casters are going to be gone here from big prime stuff in a couple of years. It's all going to be sissy rigs. Just whatever's happening in California and Japan. In five to 10 years, that's what's going to be happening here. It's always the trail. And you can see BFS is huge over in Japan. The lighter stuff is huge. Forward-facing sonar. There's a reason Californians and Japanese anglers are so good with this crap is because they're just ahead of the curve with this. I'm, the fish are more pressured. I don't know what to say about that. Yeah. No, I mean, I get it. Like, I completely understand it. It's an information tool, but like, there's so many anglers. Like, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but... I could I could rattle off a list of a bunch of anglers where you could get on a boat with forward facing and they could go on a boat with absolutely zero graphs and are literally just have mapping, just have mapping. Mapping is the most important thing. It is more important than forward facing. Yep. Those guys could just have mapping and you could have the latest and greatest 90 forward facing transducers and they're probably still going to outfish you. So, yeah, yeah. it's um it's and if you guys uh, for the people in chat maybe you follow sports in the olympics but back in the Beijing olympics the biggest problem was there was a bathing suit created that was like ten thousand dollars and only a few of our american athletes like michael phelps had it and when he put that thing on he literally won every race by like a massive margin it looked massive in the water because you took all these athletes that were basically neck and neck and you gave one just a little bit more of an advantage and it looked really great 
if you gave that same bathing suit to Joe Schmo, it doesn't do shit for him. And I think that's where there's an issue is you watch the Millikens and all these super like tip of the spear anglers and you give them all forward facing sonar. Yeah, they're gonna be that much better. But I think if you give all of us random Joes like forward facing sonar, I don't think that that equates, right? Like Tyler's probably better at it than I am. So clearly if you gave us the both setups, his ass would be better with it than me. So I think that's what's so hard with this equipment stuff is it doesn't get into the individual's ability to understand it. Uh, and, and Timmy, we're going to be getting into this. I know there's so many questions here, so I'll just shut up and we'll get through all these questions. And we can do a uh, I Hate Four Facing Sonar episode a little bit later. Uh, Kyle here. Mm-hmm. Kyle, you just won a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. As always, message me on Instagram, Facebook, or email me, fishingdmb at gmail.com to get it. Um, need to know if Tyler fishes the Terry's Run section of the lake. If so, what bait is he throwing up lake? Man, you are just straight to it, aren't you, boss? No, that's a great question. So, like, I don't, I, I definitely, the midsection, the dam section is my forte. I absolutely do run up there, especially in the spring or when the grass is coming up or if I know there's a good grass patch. Um, I keep it very simple up there. I like to throw, like, a chatterbait uh, in the grass. I go up there around when I think they're going to be spawning and they really pushed up. I like to throw a chatterbait. I like to flip. That's what I like to do. You know, I, I use forward facing up there, but it's not, it's just on. It's not really a big deal. I like to get in the grass and, and flip stuff when I go up there. That's kind of like if I need to get away from like looking at stuff, sometimes I'll run up there. I like today, for example, um, I was skipping docks um, during the hottest part of the day and, and, and caught a bunch and forward facing had nothing to do with it. I was just like, oh, dude, they're, they're up shallow. They're biting this Nika rig. Like, all right. And I was like, let me see if I still got it. So it was like a pontoon boat, not on a dock. And it's like, you know, you got the two tunes and then you got the motor and you got the little hole. And I was like, let's see if I can fit this bait through there. You know, I don't need this graph. And boop, got a three pounder straight through it. Like got it right up there. I was like, okay, I can still do this too. I caught a three pounder. And I was like, dude, I don't even care. I know what I can catch offshore because in my first 10 casts today after my thing, when I was just going out and fishing, I had 15 pounds and I was like, oh, this is sweet. And I was like, let me go check something shallow because like I'm sick and tired of this jig head shit. Sorry, I don't know if I can cuss on here. Yeah, but... you can cuss. That's <laughs> okay. fine. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> this jig head stuff. So I was like, all right, I'm going to absolutely um, go up shallow. I don't care if I'm catching one or two pounders. Like, don't get me wrong. I love offshore and it's my strength. But if I can catch them shallow or I can throw a Nico rig or I can throw this thing right here. Like if I can get up in the grass and throw this oh, thing and flip that, love that thing. Yeah, like that's what I'm doing. Unless I'm in a like, unless I'm in a tournament or even in tournaments now, Nana. Like if I fish a jackpot, like I'm just going out there and like doing what I want to do. I'm not like worrying about you know winning it. Like this past weekend, all we threw was a hangover. We threw just a swim bait, and then when we needed like oh to fill our limit, I I put on some sissy stuff and. And filled the limit. You say sissy stuff, dude, but I'm telling you, it just how many 30 pound bags and century belts for one on spinning tackle this past weekend? Like, I, it's so funny because when I was in high school fishing, like high school uh, ba- bass tournaments, I got chastised as a, as well, I can't, I definitely can't say that gamer word on here, but anyway, for throwing <laughs> just spinning shit. And now it's like everyone has just spinning tackle. It, it's just insane where we are in 2024 with that stuff. Oh, no, like, don't get me wrong. Like, I love spinning gear and stuff. I'm just, you know, I'm kind of playing into it a little bit. Like, here, like, look at that. Like, you're not throwing that on a bait caster. Like, you're not throwing these things on a bait caster. Now, I'm, I'm a re- I am a finesse fisherman. Like, I, it's definitely my strength. Um, but like I said, like, if I can choose, like, today when I knew they were up shallow and I could do that and I could go fish isolated stumps and go catch docks, on the stump deal, that was, like, the deal today like there it was five and four pounders on stumps and then under the docks it was like the three was the biggest one i caught shallow but it was like a tons of ones and twos like up shallow and i was like dude i don't even care like a nice like two pounder that just came up that's just like ready to fight like up shallow like absolutely like get me out of sitting out in the middle of the lake and sitting there and trying to get a fish to bite a little jig head like i can do it i can do it with the best of them out there but if i can go catch them shallow i'm absolutely going to do that when i'm fun fishing 
Dude, that's freaking awesome. And then we got, we got, let's see, let me pull this chat up right here. We got Joseph with the first super chat out of the night with 999. Great episode so far. We are, we are closing in on 100 people viewing right now between Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Hit the like button, guys. It really helps this thing out in the algorithm. Uh, this is freaking amazing. I can tell that everyone else thinks spring is in the air. Uh, we got a cool, we got a really good question here about vegetation. Uh, does the vegetation up like, does, uh, let me try this again. Does the vegetation up like not hold fish on Anna? I don't know why it's what what it's called, but it's thick as hell in some places. <laughs> Before Tyler answers that, I want to say vegetation is new to the lake, relatively speaking. Huge shout out to Odenkirk and a lot of these a lot of these people at DWR that are pushing to keep grass in the lake. If you're on the lake, make sure you say something because we need vegetation in this lake to make it really pop. We do not want it sprayed and gotten rid of. So anyway, sorry about that, Tyler. No, 110 percent. I'm right there with you. I'll preach that. Like if any homeowners on the lake watch this and you go and you buy chemicals for yourself and throw it around your dock, which happens, that's absolutely disgusting. Don't, don't do, do that. that. That is disgusting. That please do not do not do that. Um, the vegetation, what people don't understand, if we let hydrilla grow in this lake and any lake in virginia it will be insane it will be insane the amount of money that you could bring in from having mm -hmm. it and becoming a great fishery and you're not gonna like over pressure the, these fish if you have grass because yeah. you, you can't access all of them anywhere that there's vegetation the question there's fish anywhere there's vegetation subaquatic vegetation or even willow grass there's absolutely fish Preach. they 100 yeah. relate to it all the time um it's looking good so what i did this year is i've got some this is like one thing too where i say it's some sneaky spots like it's some sneaky stuff like as far as where hydrilla comes up in the lake um I'm, I, again other people probably know about it but i went to check on it um all i did was throw i put on a crankbait that dug way too deep and i went to these spots i wasn't even fishing i was trying to see if i could pull up some baby hydrilla and i did um so it looks like in these areas where I, I mean, I whacked them. I whacked them off this hydro. That was probably like my favorite thing from the offshore stuff. Like was I found some really cool hydrilla and just caught the hell out of them. And it's, it's coming up again this year. So I'm excited. And, and it's great. We get into a whole grass breakdown. I really, I would assume I'm not great, but I would say I'm a grass fisherman first and foremost and how I break it down. And there's a whole different, if, if you're trying to just specifically target grass fish, there's a whole different style and, almost religious like view you have to have going into it because it's way different than running and gunning it's more of a grind and really working every single edge i think one interesting part of your question i'll bring this back up here is let me see later, is uh i don't know why it's close like does the vegetation up like hold fish i think what's interesting about this this is a hypothetical thing i think there are fish at lake anna that do hold to the grass they will always naturally hold to the grass but i think fish have been so pelagic for so long it's going to take a little while for that to have that major push in population because they're going to switch from blueback eaters to like bluegill and minnow eaters. So I don't know how many years, but I think as time moves on, there will be more and more fish that will cling to, to the SAV in the lake. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully that, that kind of answers that question there. Um, I'm going to keep going through here. We got we got Joseph in there. We got another Patreon supporter. Sup, you all uh, late to the stream? I love the so. Uh, we got Andy in the chat here, and he's got another question for Tyler. Tyler, which chatterbait do you use? Are you guys ready for another secret? Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> no, this is absolutely my favorite chatterbait. This is the Stealth Blade uh, Freeloader on the back. This is Green Pumpkin Shad. It's my favorite color out there. Uh, I throw this a ton especially on the clear part in the mid lake section. Um, I don't throw a lot of your like traditional big blade chatter baits. I throw this on a, the half ounce version of the stealth blade jackhammer. Um, it's absolute killer out there. It's it's about that time too, where you can pull up on a main lake flat and fish this, run it through the flats. And once like contrary and some of those other big creeks start warming up a little bit, you can, you can catch some really good fish on this day. They eat this a little bit better, in my opinion, than your like traditional chatterbait with a you know silver or gold blade. Andy, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Message me on Facebook, Instagram, or email me fishingthedmv at gmail.com to uh, reclaim your gift card here. Oh my God, you guys are killing me. I'm going to have to start getting some kind of admin to help me filter out all these questions here. So while I create ate a file with all these questions to make sure I get them answered to you. Uh, I'm going to be lazy and defer to Tyler. Um, 
what water temperatures are you seeing right now? And where do you think they're going to be? Let me rephrase that. What next water temperature are you looking for that you think will trigger the next movement of fish? Um, oh, they're coming up right now. They're they're moving. They're up. They're just freaking coming up on the down section by the dam and the mid section. Like every day, they're just piling up. It doesn't. I don't. I don't even care. Like if we had a cold snap, they're still coming. The fo- the the daylight is increasing. The water. I mean, you have to remember at the dam section, you have hot water pumping into it, and that wind constantly is blowing and pushing that warm water and spreading it out throughout the lakes uh for the dam and like where you kind of talk about the midsection as well um the close the further you get up towards the split it definitely is more of like a winter bite and you're still seeing water temps and it's probably touching about 50 now i haven't been up the splits and recently the last time i was up there it was in the mid 40s so it should be up there the warmest water i fished today was 62 degrees uh in a back protected pocket um that gets a lot of constant sunlight and is in the dam section uh of the lake uh and then if you run to the main lake you're seeing i mean it, it's fluctuating anna's interesting it varies so much but you're getting from about 50 to uh, 55 is pretty consistent and then when you get a day like today where the sun hits it a while you're getting your surface temp up and some of the mouths of the creeks and all that and the calm water uh in the high 50s and then some back sneaky pockets you can get up into the 60s on a day like today that's freaking i just ah i'm getting excited it's that time of year glide baits do you throw them if if so what's your what's your vibe on them if not we'll move on to another idea yeah i know i'm i love i love line throughs i'm a big line through guy i throw these a lot um i like i like line throughs glides i do have a few some of them are so expensive. I'm like afraid to flow, uh, to throw. I'm not an expert on that. Um, that's something, uh, you know, there's, there's definitely better people to ask or watch videos on that as far as glides. Uh, but with like the big line through deal, I, I do understand that a little bit better. The glide thing is interesting. I know people are going to hit about that. My, my deal with that is it's kind of hit or miss. Like, what are you doing when you go to the lake? If you are trying to swing for the fence for a home run, yeah, probably tie on a line through or a big old glide. If you're fishing for points, I think that's the difference. And again, I think that's important. I know um, the Northern Virginia Kayak Series is, is coming there late March. If you're just trying to survive the series, really don't think you should tie on a big-ass glide bait and just lock that in for eight hours. You could either win or you just suck. Uh, I It reminds me of the old-school people that fish jigs, the people that lock it in their hand, they either blank or win the tournament. I feel like that's kind of what it is with the glide bait. Again, I could be wrong. I think there's guys that are really good with four fishing center that know like when to put it down. Uh, but that's just my my two cents on that. Um, let's see. We got we got Timmy. Uh, Timmy's blowing up the chat. Uh, they're going to chew out their shallows. The shallow tomorrow is supposed to be 70. I think we're going to have some pretty crazy days with this first warm front coming in here. Uh, just me. I would take off work for the next couple of weeks if, if, if you guys can in the chat. Uh, Ed. Today was ridiculous out there. It was one of those days throughout the year where Anna shows itself. I mean, I could do what I wanted where on Anna, you're like. That's insane. Oh, I got to throw a little jig ahead. <laughs> jig ahead in a Today, you can do what you wanted. How long does that power bite last? Do you think is it w- until like the pleasure boaters come out in force, or is it more of like once the spawns over, then it's just little jig head minnow? No, nah, so like Anna's a great summer lake. It's a fantastic summer lake. Um, hmm. I mean, I I love the summer there. I love it. Give me a bluebird sky and a two ounce top water, and just push me out there, and we'll have some fun. That's so freaking cool. Uh, let's see. Let's see. We got so many questions here, guys. And make sure we get to all of them. Uh, I was out on. We got Ed uh, Ed Greens. Uh, I was out on Anna today and did not see many fish in the five to fifteen foot range. Do you focus on bait balls or locations? And before Tyler answers that, Ed, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Uh, please message me on Facebook, Instagram, wherever, and I'll make sure I get that to you. And uh, that's a great question. Um, so what I'm looking for is, um, you know, it depends on what you're doing. They definitely are in between five and 15. It just depends on where you are in the lake. If you do see bait, uh, you, you are technically in the right area. You just need to look around for the high percentage stuff, whether kind of structure or kind of high spots and things that they're relating to. Um, 
it's it's definitely can be a bit of a needle in a haystack thing so you know you probably were in the right depth it just depends on exactly where you were on the lake uh, and then what specifically you know you were doing so it's a bit of a question that could go a lot of different ways but i would just say like keep your head down and pick apart section by section every time you go out and focus on a small area and just constantly build on that and things will you know start to make sense like today i caught like i said my deepest fish i caught in 37 my shallowest i caught in three and there was fish in between and probably deeper shallower than all of those ranges today their fish throughout the lake are doing all sorts of different things right now that's i'm just ah i'm just so excited for us getting this weather here where we can actually get out and try some of these techniques if you're a kayak angler and you know kayak angling is getting a, hot, a lot hotter there's more and more people going to the lake to kayak fish not all well, more kayaks have for fishing center but a lot don't can you have success as a kayak angler between now and and may on the lake or is it pretty hard without electronics no you can for sure on a kayak um like i'm trying to think uh you know i wouldn't be going and fishing in the middle of the lake in the kayak for like safety reasons um yeah but for that so i would just break down a creek um and do that there is going to be a good a good shallow shallow bite there's a shallow bite right now and again as it keeps warming up the shallow bite and all these big creeks and you know i'll just use i just use contrary because it's like probably one of the most well-known creeks right there but like as it starts to heat up contrary is is really good throughout and there definitely is a that's a good that's a good creek and where i would put a kayak and if i was fishing the tournament probably is in contrary um and there is a shallow bite again look at your mapping look at transition banks find shallow to deep find the channel swings find the little things like that and then put yourself in the best position um and then other than that what i would do depending on if it was like late march and then april i would pick a creek with a lot of docks and just skip docks all day and like put your bait in places that other people aren't um that would be how i would go about a kayak i'm not a a, a seasoned kayak angler by any means but that's what i would do that's such freak that's great advice uh we got let's see we got green we got green dave 41 give me the middle of the lake in my kayak anytime after spawn uh you are gutsy sir uh, yeah, i just think like pleasure a dangerous man that's a dangerous man on that lake. yeah to me it's more pleasure but i know some of these kayaks are built like battleships but it's just damn that even in my ranger some of them jet skiers man they get they are insane they are <laughs> suicide bombers uh let's see we got green day 41 again uh to that point a tournament was just won on uh sutton lake in north carolina on four on, on ff on ffs i hate acronyms to my core four fancy center and uh uh and anisi on stumps oh yeah 100 percent like Forward facing sonar is is here to stay and it really helps you i think forward facing sonar and glide baits is so interesting because it's just it's a glorified jerk bait is what a what a glide bait is it's the idea is you're getting that reaction strike and you know how to work it to trigger that kind of reaction so it works extremely well um 100 percent so and i think we touched on this but since we have so many people in the chat compared to when we initially said this what are kind of like your top techniques to start with when you go out on the water at this time of year uh so this time of year um I change it up like so if I break it down to the top so every day for me again like I just have the luxury of being out there so much so I tried to read the individual day and what the conditions are telling me um, I'm definitely going to have the Miki rig on um, God I'm so sick of doing that but if I need to catch them <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have a Miki rig on I'm going to have a line through on for sure um, probably a nico rig a nico rig was getting me some good bites today off the stomps that's how i was doing and i was throwing a nico rig on on isolated stomps that would have one big fish on it that's how i caught my fish today for the most part um i caught the ones in 37 foot Demiki rigging and then i was like screw this i don't care i will go fish shallow so Demiki rig line through um drop shot nico rig uh, this chatterbait is about to come into play too. The stealth blade that we talked about. Um, you know, I I made a video recently where I fished a shaky head. Um, 
uh, I just, I kind of just wanted to show people if like to just go back to the basics sometimes and dumb it down a little bit. Um, so shaky heads, another great bait out there. If you have forward facing sonar, again, you can see what the fish are relating to. Are they on the bottom? If you're new to forward facing, it can be really hard to read fish on the bottom. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to adjust my approach based on, on that and what I'm seeing for the day. And then there is also conditions that can tell you that without forward facing sonar. And if you have like a warm prefront coming in, probably not going to be on the bottom. They're going to be more willing to rise. They're going to be suspended. They'll actually feed down and they'll feed up. Like that's how it was today. I mean, I could throw something over their head or I could drop something below them and they would go down and eat it. Um, and then if you get a, you know, high pressure, like terrible conditions, cold front comes in, they're going to be feeding down for the most part. So think about that as well. Um, a Carolina rig as well. I know I'm rattling off a bunch of baits. Like, as you can tell, this is my favorite time of year. Cause I, I junk fish. I absolutely love junk fishing. Um, and I, I use that and see different ways that I can incorporate that into forward facing, like how I brought that example up. A lot of times what you can do on a brush pile with a lot of bass on it is you can get them fired up and the striper, whether it's through their lateral line or they see it or something, if they're nearby, they will know that something's going on and they will come and sometimes they'll force most of the bass. Some of the bigger bass don't care to the bottom of the brush pile. And so when I don't want to catch a striper, that's when I'll throw a Carolina rig or an eco rig or something I can get to the bottom on that brush pile to get to the bass and keep the striper away. Like on one brush pile today, for instance, I caught a four pound, four pound largemouth, got them all fired up. And I mean, a, just a jumbo school of striper came in and I was like, oh my God. So then I went, I threw a Carolina rig. Um, I just used a little baby brush hog and caught another two pounder. So you can do that as well and that's just again me spending time in the water and seeing all the fish behavior and understanding i can do that to get another bite um but yeah so carolina rig nico rig chatterbait drop shot shaky head uh and then a line through like this bait right here this is a fantastic bait a hmm. great bait you'll catch a ton of fish that are like two pounds on it and you'll also catch some of the biggest fish in the lake especially on a, on a day like today and a day like tomorrow, I'm assuming they're going to eat something like that. Pretty good. That's so freaking cool. Um, let's see. Got Ed's got another question there. I'll make sure we get to that one. And, and then guys, uh, this is what we're going to do here to really just celebrate Tyler back on the show. If we get three more Patreon supporters, I get three more Patreon supporters to sign up of those three. I'm going to give away a fishing trip with Tyler uh, to kind of celebrate him beginning on the show and to celebrate us hitting our big milestone. I'll be giving away a fishing trip to our Patreon supporters. I'll raffle it off. Um, this is freaking awesome that spring is back in the air here and we're able to, to really talk fishing. And let me get back to where I... Uh, here we go. Shane, here's a question that you uh, you had a little bit earlier in the, in the show. Shane Flynn Outdoors. What is your biggest bass on Lake Anna? Guys, keep the questions flowing. Eight pounds. Jesus, that's actually bigger than I thought for Lake Anna. Damn. No, it was big. I caught it on top water. Oh my god. Yeah. I caught a seven um last year, caught an eight. I caught multiple sevens last year. Um and a few sixes. And then it seems like these were like very sprat. And you have to understand I was out on the lake 125 days last year. So and they were like 12 hour days. Um, so yeah, it's a very, very rare thing. Um, and these were like just crazy situations. They were all pretty deep fish. Um, but yeah, it seems like they're few and far between. There's a lot of three and four pounders and then, you know, there's some fives and then you get the very rare chance that you can catch something like that. That's insane. Do you think there's a 10 pounder swimming around there? Yeah, there is. I'm sure there is. Mm. I, I just don't think he's probably really smart. Probably seeing everything. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. I think the biggest fish in the lake is probably the most intelligent. Um, you've mentioned the Nico rig a lot. How yeah. would you classify it? What the hell is it? Is it just an advanced shaky head? Is it more of like a wacky room with the weight? Like, I, I have a weird time with that rig putting it. Is it like a hover rig? Like, how would you categorize it? If so it's a uh, shaky head wacky rig. <laughs> so. There you go. Yeah, a shaky head wacky rig. So this is like what I did today. I caught a lot of good fish on this. 
Um, this is just like a, a general or a dinger. I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me. I I just I usually buy Yum Dingers or Berkeley Generals. Uh, Nico rig it. I also like to Nico rig this worm right here, a Rain's Bubble Shaker. Hmm. Um, this color in particular, Morning Dawn, are like out there a lot. Um, but yeah, no, a Nico rig is an absolutely great bait for for brush piles for skipping. It's something a little different. I still think like everyone knows what it is or I've heard of it now, but I don't think it gets thrown a ton. Um, and then I'll show a bait that me and my buddy in the state championship last year and we had a really good, really good first day. Or no, this was the first time before a state championship. This was in April. Uh, so this right here, this is a divine a divine shaky head worm. So when it does get warm up in about April and when they're spawning, I Nico rig this thing. It's a pretty big worm. Um, hmm. And I Nico rig that a lot and get catch, get a lot of good bites on that out there. Um, so that's a divine six cents, divine shaky worm. I like the Nico rig it a lot. It's, you know, you could, pr you could probably get away with it right now, but I wait till the water to warm up a little bit and have you know more of the females up shallow before i throw that bigger bigger worm on a nico rig how much weight are you going for is it just enough to get it to sink a little bit faster or do you want it to like drop to the bottom like a rock no nah, so i don't want it to drop to the bottom like a rock i think this is like a 332 or something nail weight that i have in this one um i don't want it again like if you're reading the fish behavior if you do have forward facing sonar uh you can see but i want the lightest thing possible that i can get away with with the conditions uh i'm a big believer in the lightest weights possible when you're vanessa fishing that you can mm. get away with um and another thing too this is a, a tip i see this a lot because I, when i go out with clients a lot and they fish a drop shot they fish a nico rig or they fish a shaky head is too much movement you're, you're moving your rod too much like yes those baits are designed to there's there's some sort of current and pressure from the water where you don't need to do much to make that bait do what it needs to do like a nico rig i'm not there's okay there's some instances on brush piles where i snap it or i i snap it to trigger a bite but that's like for the most part like today if i would see it i would just let it shimmy I wouldn't even touch it, not even touch it. And then I would let it fall to the bottom and I'm not, I'm not even moving it. I'm not even moving. I'm watching the fish go down to it. I'm not moving it. So many people I, that I take out with it, that's the first thing I try to correct. Drop shot, Nico rigs. Like, oh, I'm like, what is going on? You're scaring me. You're scaring the fish. <laughs> like, you're not serious. Not, but like for real, like those baits just do what they need to do naturally by the way they're set up. So you don't need to overshake things. And I think this is this is something that I was taught. Could be wrong here. I'd love to get your pick on it. When you're doing the the Nico rig or Damiki, because that's something I did a shit ton this winter was Damiki rig fishing and learning that. You're not trying to shake the bait. It's you're trying to tap the line. You're trying to shake the line. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand it first until I started doing it. It's like there's a huge difference where you're trying, if you're trying to shake the bait, guys, I almost feel like you're trying to feel the bait at the end of the tip of your rod and you're shaking that, which puts way too much action in it versus if you have your bait weighed properly, you're just trying to put a little bit of pulse in the line and that'll go down and give it that quiver. Right. Is, is that what you're thinking or is it even less than that? No, that's exactly what I'm thinking, especially this time of year at the Damiki. That's like one of the little things too, I'll be honest. Like if I do post a video, sometimes I try to hide what I'm doing with my hands because I'm more worried about what I'm doing with my hands. Um, I do some weird stuff. Some of my buddies with the, the Niki will be like, what the f is going on? I have a, I have a weird thing I do with a Damiki and it triggers some bites. Um, it's an up and down action with your rod handle. <laughs> it's so subtle. It's so subtle. It's nothing. It's shake it. When you get now, when you get into the summer and you're throwing the freeloader, everyone knows about it now that if you're throwing the freeloader, you can absolutely, you can give it some and like give it a little bit of rhythm when you're going in. But like in, when you're talking winter and early pre-spawn, you want that bait. That bait is designed to move on its own without you doing much. So you don't have to do much to get that bait to move. You just want to, it's more important to have it suspend and have it above the fish. You, there's some time, again, I say this to the grain of salt, there's times where you can snap it off the bottom. 
but you always want to keep that bait above the fish and do the most subtle movements possible, especially this time of year. That is freaking awesome. And then we just had Justin Marsh just join the Patreon. Hail, dude. Thank you so much. Um, if we get two more people to join the Patreon tonight, I'm going to be giving away a trip with this legend right here to, to those three people in particular. I'm going to, I'm going to raffle it off between those three. And then we got a couple of other prizes I'm going to give away tonight as well. Uh, we got Blink Nation here. Blink Nation says, agreed. Uh, was telling my buddy, if you have the option, go with outweight when you can, eat to maximize the natural bait action. 100% agree with that, 100%. And then my thought here is, I think people make their rod way too heavy of action when you're dealing with these lighter, almost forward-facing sonar techniques. Um, going mm -hmm. with as light, uh, as fast of a taper as you can, just so you can get your casting distance and you can really feel that weightless presentation on the end. It's big time. It makes a huge difference. Um, yeah, parabolic bend is huge. Um, yes. Having a rod like if you get you most of my rods that's what i'm worried about like i throw a lot of heavy rods for things you wouldn't think but that's okay just as long as the the rod is super parabolic that's very important especially with finesse techniques as well yes 100 percent agree with that what is your what line are you running with your main and your leader are you going like 12 pound braid to like six pound fluorocarbon um i've got them all a little bit different so <laughs> this one just got out of the bag like i was doing this uh for a while and uh i i actually <laughs> the way i found it's crazy i won't go into it but one of the ways i do like to throw the miki is i i throw i was throwing 14 pound for our 10 pound braid on 14 pound fluorocarbon uh that's something that koya was doing and he kind of exposed that there was some people that knew i the way i found out about this was like a year ago and it was like from some forum board talking about jdm techniques uh, just the way the bait sits. So for, for a Damiki rig, I, I have a bunch of everything. I use mono. I use 10 pound braid to 14 pound. I use 10 pound braid to eight pound fluoro. Um, I switch it up a lot and just mess with the sink rates and the fall rates. Thank you so much. I was, people thought I was batshit crazy with how anal I get with my spy baiting because I will spy bait in shallower water when it calls for it. And I will go with mono that's 15 pound test as my, as my tag into the braid, because I can get more lift to get that heavy ass bait off the bottom. Cause if you guys don't know, there's not a lot of spy baits that are really made for like 10 foot plus, like 10 foot or shallower water. And I mess around with my leader material to get the bait up off the bottom. Mm -hmm. People think that's crazy, but that's such an easy way that you can adjust and tweak that fall rate that no one really does or talks about. Yeah. With, uh, with a Damiki, uh, with the freeloader in particular, I throw pretty heavy mono because um, I can do things with that bait that you can't do with fluorocarbon and pause it and keep it in front of the nose of a fish and just give it uh, weird actions. And then you'll even see like the same thing. Like uh, I use like a shorter, heavier leader with the Damiki, and like you see a lot of people just kind of set into them. Like I crack my fish, um, all of them. I, I fish a Damiki on a bait caster as well, which is a little different. I do, I do spinning as well. It just depends on the weight and what I want to do like for that day and how the fish are. Uh, but yeah, that's something that's way more important than like a bait color and yep. a specific bait is like play around with your line size. Like you could run into something that no one else is doing or very few people are doing and you can see a difference. Like I could, I knew for a fact, like I would throw at the same fish with fluoro and then I would go to the mono and be able to like pause it and keep it as it would chase and like just have it almost perfectly suspend like a perfectly suspending jerk bait for a second and they would like boom eat it usually when you kill a bait on forward facing your bait's falling your bait's falling tracking 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 your bait falls fish doesn't care go away goes away if you let your if it's tracking 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 that that's a, another big tip if you are using forward facing you can see a fish follow, get so excited, and, you're like, and you change your retrieve for one second. Yep. All is one second. All you need is one second. A fish is gone. So you just like do 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 do. Don't don't even like worry about it. Don't stop. Don't stop. Keep it exactly how you're doing, uh, exactly what you're doing. And then if you do find something like, oh, if I if I'm doing that, and then I snap, and then it will bite. Or if I pause for a second, and I can have a line that keeps my bait like still for a second, that can be the subtle difference. That can be a big thing. Dude, 
Guys, this is absolutely the juice. You need to go guiding. You need to go out with him this year. Really kind of support him. He's an absolute gem. Uh, Brew Tank, uh, you get your 100 Patreon tonight. Got to chug a beer live. I do not have beer or tequila, but uh, I wish I did, honestly. I will be down uh, at Smith Mountain Lake Thursday night with uh, SB Fishing and stuff. We have a house. We will have tons of alcohol, and we will be doing a live stream. So mm-hmm. I apologize for whatever I say in advance, but we'll celebrate then 100% boss. We got Kyle I. Uh, the meat and the potatoes we need. No, a hundred percent. And then Tim, Tim has given us given away some stuff. Uh, throwing the jackal iprop seventy five. They don't sink as fast, and they have best stock hooks. They chew it. Uh, you know, people don't throw the spy bait, and I've been talking about it for a year, and still no one throws it. So that's fine. It's just more for me. It, it has. It's like Brian Thrift says. It's a nice thing I have on my deck in case I see the conditions line up, and I have it ready to go. And it throws. Probably just as good as a tuna size walking bait. It can cast so damn far. If you see a schooling fish on the other side of a cove, you can probably hit it with a spy bait. Like those yeah. suckers fly. Yeah, they um, do. They do have a spy bait get up there. To me, that's it, the exact. That's the exact spy bait that I throw as well, man. Dude, oh Lord, did you let him in your boat or something, man? He's just poaching all your shit. I'm telling you. No, uh, no, he, he's good. We we fish very similar. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I ought to go out with you, Timmy. I want to see you fish shallow, though. I want to see a yeah. crack one on a frog. I would love to watch you guys live stream together. That would be a fantastic fight. Uh, I think you caught a big with me on a spy bait. I did. I caught a big one with you. I blew your mind with the whole spy bait thing, Shane. And then you started to crack some big ones, too, recently, I think. Uh, okay, got Kyle I again. Best top water for Anna. That is a hot topic. You guys ready for another secret? <laughs> All right, the biggest freaking top water you can find. I don't care if it's a salt. I like the KVD Mega Dog. Um, I talked about this before on this show. The reason that bait is better than the Six Sense Catwalk, I'm a big, I love Six Sense baits, um, is the weight. So the Catwalk, uh, a lot of times you can get, I'm trying to get my hands right. So you, you have this top water. The Mega Dog is so heavy. So a fish will swipe it. And the, since the bait is so heavy, it stays in hooks, whereas the Six Sense Catwalk is another good one, and it's super light. So when they do that, it's so light. Sometimes the bait, like, bounces out of the out of the water. So get a heavy, heavy, big, big topwater, and that's all I'll say. I think the biggest secret there um, that I'll help a lot of the water is stop – Everyone in the chat, stop being ignorant that bass fishing is the only thing that created baits. Please stop doing that. Go and look in the saltwater section and you'll find some freaking gems. Most of my big topwater plugs. And if you're down south, go to some of the bait and tackle shops down south on Blueback Lakes, Lake Murray and Hartwell. They're selling saltwater size walking baits and poppers. You would think it's for tuna. But again, when you're over 30 feet of water and you have that big ass plug, the drawing power is insane. And I, I really think it's not... Maybe I, a part of it is the size. Like it does represent a big blueback, but it's just the drawing power. If that fish is down 20 feet and that sucker hits the surface, it gets their attention. No, I don't know how many times I have a video. I'm, I, I have a video 100%. I don't know if it's on, I think it's on Instagram, but with that bait too, like I don't know how many times I would have like a three pounder on the front hook and a three pounder on the back hook. At the same time, like you're reeling in six pounds and one cast, and you're just good lord. Uh, I mean, I'm a boat flipper when I do that, boat flip them <laughs> 40 pound, 40 pound braid, throw it on 40 pound braid, guys. Um, so I am having everything up here. We just had one, two, three, four, we had eight people just sign up for Patreon. Let's go. Um, my god, I feel like I'm a pimp just pawning out Tyler here. So Let's apparently, go. you guys like his goods. Um, I will get with Tyler after this and we'll figure out how the hell we're going to figure out who won this thing. And I will get in touch with you on Patreon, of course, and we'll make the, the announcement for the winner and you can get with Tyler to schedule your trip. And then I'll give out some other prizes. I think I'm going to give out a tiger crank paint kind of gift package as well. Uh, my wife and all my sponsors are sweating right now because I come up with this shit on the fly without telling them. So I'll figure that stuff out later. That's my problem. <laughs> But yeah, guys, thank you so much. That's freaking awesome here. Um, do you guys have like do you have any tournaments coming up? Are you gonna be fishing the, the TBF, the BFLs, or anything like that coming up? Uh, I'm gonna be doing like the Sunday series, uh, and then a bunch of just jackpots and stuff. And like my mindset this year is like I'm going to like have fun. Like I don't care if I win, don't care if I lose, don't 
I don't care. <laughs> so I'm just going out to fish and like reading the day and like having fun. Like me and like one of my best buddies, like from growing up, like we fish team tournaments, like all growing up, like we are just being stupid. Like this past weekend fishing a tournament, like don't take it too serious. And I think that's just like the way to do it. Um, I do want to get into like some bigger, like two day events or, or fish some BFLs. I want to expand, go to Smith mountain. I want to fish, other stuff but like on anna i'll be if there's a big tournament on it and i can get in it i'll I'll, i will absolutely fish it um it's just it's hard being a guide and fishing tournaments and having the schedule and and getting all that stuff so i kind of just pick and choose but i'll be fishing a lot a lot of tournaments this year and just having a good time with it and then hopefully i can get into some bigger ones down in smith mountain maybe go to the chick and and uh Chesden, I want to go on Chesden. Chesden is awesome, so maybe I can get down there as well. I, I want to fish Chesden. I really am trying to hook up with some people down there to fish uh, to do a Hidden Gems documentary on Chesden. I feel like that's a, a quiet lake that no one talks about in Virginia. Uh, another <laughs> one is so fun. It's so much fun. Um, there's some big ass fish. I saw SB. He pokes a lot of giants out of there. Yeah, no, it's awesome. So like, like. I'll be honest with everyone. I fish Anna so much, but Lake Anna is still Lake Anna. Like, imagine guiding on it if you think you go out there and have a hard day. Like, it is a hard lake. I will tell you that. It's a it's a hard lake to fish. I went to Cheston twice last year, and it was, like, the easiest thing. Oh, here's some pads. Here's some grass. Here's where this channel swings back into the spawning flat. Go throw a freaking chatterbait. I had 20 pounds. The first day I ever went on Cheston, I just threw a chatterbait and caught 20 pounds. And I was like, okay this is freaking awesome. <laughs> so, so like my experience on Cheston has been like, it's just a great fishery. And that, that's interesting. Cause you, you say yourself as I'm offshore forward facing guy. That's what you're good at. But I think this is an mm-hmm. interesting thing. That's what you're good at. But is that what you enjoy doing? Like if you could go anywhere, what do you enjoy doing fishing wise? Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, I grew up like my fishing beginnings are pretty humble. I was a kid that dragged a trolling motor with fishing rods to a John boat and learned how to like flip a jig and, you know, fish stuff like that. Uh, Frogging. I spent a lot of time on the Potomac. Like if I had to pick and choose like today, you said like I knew I was only going to probably catch two, maybe three pounders and some one pounders. But if I can go up there and catch them shallow and skip docks and get around that shallow stuff, I'm absolutely going to do that um i just i know i'm i'm i know i'm my strength is offshore now i it's unfortunate like it's just it just is um but no if i can boat flip and throw big bait or frog or top water or something like that's what i want to do um so that's what my heart wants but my mind makes me go out and says hey dummy (laughs) you know you can go out there and catch more weight and you know exactly what you're doing and how to do it but yep. my heart wants to go shallow. <laughs> my, I am a, I'm a smallmouth river guy. I, as much as I try to be, I probably have made all my money fishing grass and tidal. But then I have always been a smallmouth BFS kind of guy. I mean, I live on the Upper Potomac, Shenandoah, um, and I'm getting better with offshore. Uh, like I would like to say that that's something I've always want to constantly improve on to get up to the Millican and and, and your level of it because it is it's. You shit, you just got to learn how to do it just to be able to survive the tournament scene. But damn it, if I could, there's so many other ways I'd rather do it because it's just more, I just think it's more fun. And again, it's not like saying like, I'm, I'm not, when I say that, I'm not shitting on forward facing sonar. I just prefer a frog bite. I prefer yeah. you know, chasing smallmouth shallow in riffles. Um, I like the hunting aspect way more. Uh, and we got a really cool, we got two good questions here. We got uh, Bink, N- Bink, B I N, yeah, Bink Nation, uh, jealous of y'all, LOL, uh, up, up north here in Maine, we're we're stop praying for some more open water, warm weather this week. So we're getting up. What do you mean by Maine? Jesus, I could not. You must be depressed. So many months out of the year, I could not live in a place that was frozen for eight months. Shout out Tyler Williams, <sighs> he's awesome. Have you seen Hail. him on the on the uh, the the guy from Maine on the elites now? He throws a jig, black and a brown one, and just catches them everywhere. It's awesome. Oh, we got Brew Tank here. A Brew Tank, uh, fishing the DMV Patreon only tournament. So I am going to try to talk to uh, my man Shane Flint. I'm going to try to figure out how to do a Patreon only online tournament. That is something I'm going to try to do with prizes. 
not going to lie to you. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So I'm going to figure it out to beta test it. We do do photo contest giveaways. Get it? Once you're a Patreon member, you're going to get a link to our private Facebook group. Post any fish catch photos you have. And then my wife gets to pick. So you yell at her if she doesn't pick you. And we'll pick four or five and you'll win for the month. While that's going on, I am going to figure out how to do those stupid apps for like taking a picture of a measured fish to try to win. Um, I'm not going to give away Shane front level prizes because he's like Mr. Beast giving away half a million dollars each time. That'll be happening later. But this is just something to give you guys a little bit back. Uh, the other thing, if you guys don't know, when we hit 600 Patreon supporters, I got permission from the Department of Wildlife Resources for Virginia and Maryland to do supplemental stocking. We can start supplementing stocking largemouth and smallmouth from e either state, wherever you guys choose as Patreon supporters. Uh, besides that, we are also going to work with doing ramp um, renovations. There's a lot of shitty boat ramps out there that we could give a lot of TLC to and a lot of trash cleanup. That's something I want to start doing as well. I'm really passionate about that. I live near some really shitty boat ramps in the Shenandoah and the Upper Potomac. We can start giving some TLC, put a dock in, make those things a lot better, and then work our way down to Lake Anna. Even though it sounds like they're getting a billion-dollar golf course in like four years or something, crazy like that so that place is going to be that place is going to be freaking nuts here in a while and we got timmy dropping five dollars here timmy with a five dollar super chat uh ready for fishing trip getting raffled off uh yeah T timmy if you want to come on the show sometime i'll i'll pimp you out too boss it's no problem <laughs> we'll have you both on the show next time that'd be freaking a hoot yeah let's do that um timmy do you actually guide or are you just stalking poor tyler on the water just need to need to confirm that you're not some weirdo uh, that's no. <laughs> Tyler doesn't answer the uh, question. <laughs> no, Timmy is no. Timmy's a young stick on Anna. Okay, awesome. He, yeah, knows, so he knows he knows what he's doing. I, I, me and him should be on at the same time. That'd be fun, dude. That'd be that would be freaking awesome. And again, I said like if you guys live stream together on the water, I would watch the shit out of that while I'm at work. Um, uh, let's see, Jason, and then we're gonna probably we're gonna have to be cutting off the questions here, guys. This has absolutely been insane. Uh. How, uh, uh, Jason, we got Jason here. Uh, how, how do hair jigs work on Anna? They work great for rivers, but what about lakes like Anna? It, ooh, ooh. I uh, added that before Tyler answered that. Do you mean like a smallmouth hair jig or like a Jacob Wheeler TVA hair jig? You guys are good. I'm giving away all the secrets. <laughs> they work. I fish them offshore a lot. And in the summer, I fish like those big freaking hair jigs, big hair jigs. See, that's what I'm saying. Like, I hate this minnow crap. I know how to do it, and I've learned to do some really cool stuff with it. But I use forward facing to like fish how I want. Like I said, like I'm throwing giant top water. I throw those big hair jigs and like that sort of stuff. They work. And this is the thing. If I gave you ten secret baits, like I, no, I'll say okay, uh, Tyler or, or, or anyone, Kyle. I'm just gonna put on Kyle in the chat. If I say Kyle, here are five secret baits. Go out and fish them. You cannot fish all five at the same time. So if I say you can fish a Nico rig, a big spoon, a, a Magnum spoon, a hair jig, all this, fantastic. They're all secret baits, but you still have to be able to pick one to throw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You On know? my end, when I keep saying secret baits, I'm being super sarcastic. Nothing is like... No. Yeah. It, it, it's not you. It's just so many people I run across in my day-to-day -day when I go to boat ramps and I ask like how to go and they feel like, well, I just discovered the holy grail of Jesus and it's this bait. And it's like... <laughs> You still got to know when to throw it, and you still got to have the instinct yep. to know like, that exactly <laughs> yeah. work, right? Exactly. You still have to be able to. That is the most important thing. Is like processing the information and knowing when to use that bait versus when not to. One hundred percent. Was the Whopper Plopper the last like simpleton lure that came out that worked? I mean, okay, maybe simpleton's a little harsh, but like you just tie it on and throw it. <laughs> and your girlfriend could catch a great one because I, I I don't yep. I don't know because even the hover rigs and the strolling rigs and the different heads there's a level of skill you freaking need to make that shit work. Yeah, hover rigging is fun. I I do that. I mess with that. But yeah, I, I feel like a whopper popper is like the true like. Here you go, tie it on cat. Like yeah, that's a great bait too. So like, uh, on guide trips in particular, I, uh. It's it's kind of interesting if the uh, if the big walking bait bite isn't working, a big plopper bite works. Um, so like if they aren't really committing to the big, you can pull on a plopper, and then all of a sudden they'll just smash it. That's so freaking cool, dude! And, and guys, we're gonna have Tyler again on uh, probably late. Uh, 
Well, I, I better give this juice away too. Uh, there's a there's a guy that has worked at a bait shop down at at Lake Anna. Uh, if you guys know, you know. Uh, it's at one of the marinas. I'll give that much away. I'm going to try to figure out a time that I'm going to do a live interview with with Tyler and this individual there at the bait shop. Uh, and hopefully, I think that would be a really cool. Uh, really cool piece of material to have. It'll hopefully be warm enough we can actually freaking do it. So probably late March is when we'll record it. But I think that'd be really cool to, to talk about that and to talk about what Tyler's been up to. And hopefully you've had a tournament under your belt too that we can kind of talk about as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. I have a bunch. Like this past weekend, we fished a little jackpot and just threw the hangover all day and caught some fish. And it was a terrible weather day, but you know, so yeah, I'll definitely have some more, more in the books by then. Freaking awesome. Uh, how can people follow you? How can people book a trip with you? Yeah, so I think you'll have the, like the website and all that will be down below. Yep. Um, that'll be my number. It's lakeannabassfishing.com. That's the website. Uh, you can book a trip directly. You can see a calendar with availability. You can give me a call, give me a text. Um, if I take a second to get to you during the day, it's probably because I'm on the water or I'm doing stuff for my other job. Uh, but I will get to you as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, and then it's, uh, I think he'll have a link for my Instagram too down below. I post on that the most. And then the Facebook page, I post on there a lot. Uh, I really am trying to emphasize educational content uh, this year and stuff that people can can take and, and hopefully um, use when they go out on the water. Uh, I posted one video on Instagram this a couple of days ago. I'll have that on the Facebook page and it's about keeping it simple, stupid. And it's just like, Ooh, I like that. you're spinning out and, and, and you need to just kind of keep it simple, stupid, like, and you don't need to worry about what everyone else is doing it and just dumb down your fishing and you can start catching a lot more. So a lot of stuff like that. And, and, you know, staying fishy this year, staying real fishy. Dude, right. Freaking on. I did check guys. The links are up right now on the live stream on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, as always with these Monday night live streams, I take them down in the evening to check, to make sure we didn't say anything that's going to get us completely just destroyed on YouTube. And I clean up the audio and then it gets re-uploaded tomorrow back on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and the whole shebang. Please go support Tyler. Uh, and then we will, uh, we will also be having another big, really awesome episode dropping this Thursday. So tomorrow morning, this gets re-uploaded. And then Thursday, we've got another episode. Uh, like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps out in the algorithm. Thank you guys so much more again. And then we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.